Hello everybody, this is Stephen Allison and this is my youth review. It's fastly becoming my favourite video of the week to do. So, okay, I think this happened a little bit late. Let's just get straight into this because obviously it is the headline. Let's get fired straight into it. I think this happened late last week, might have been over the weekend. I'm not 100% sure on what's happened here, but one of the most liked coaches, a man with 30-year association with Manchester United, has been sacked, right? Okay, that, that happens, right? I understand sometimes, especially under a new regime like what's going on with Nicky Butt and all the rest of it, that changes have to be made. But a man with such a long association with the club deserves to be treated with a little bit of respect, in my opinion. And from what I found out, there's been no respect. Clayton Blackmore, uh, League and FA Cup winner on, uh, with United, has been sacked by email, right? Think about that. What sort of shit house sacks someone by email? I believe the person who did this was John Murtar. I think that's how you pronounce it, at least, anyway. Who is an administrator of the academy who was brought in by David Moyes when he first joined the club. The players that I've spoken to are big fans of Clayton. Um, he's a bloke who you can imagine, um, if you've ever seen him around. Um, he's got a great rapport with the young lads. Uh, someone who makes training fun. So I think he's a loss on quite a few levels, but he has been let go. I'm not really bothered that he's been let go too much. I'm sure Clayton is. Uh, but it's the manner of disrespect that they've shown in doing it the way that they've done it. It sounds like the scouts are being replaced. Clearly now the coaches are starting to be replaced. Um... I just don't like the way they've done it. I do not like the way they've done it. I mean, it's absolutely disgusting that you've not brought him in to have a meeting uh, and tell him why, face to face. You've just sent him an email. Clayton's always been someone um, that's open to speaking to the likes of me as well at the training ground and stuff like that. So that's it's a sad loss from my point of view that I probably won't be seeing him around at the games anymore. But it sounds like the players are going to miss him as well. And if everyone's coming and going the same way, like who's next? Uh, while we're talking about things that aren't quite right, I mentioned it in my Snapchat Q&A yesterday that someone's made a video saying that Angel was born in Portugal. And that's the problem when you don't have a fucking clue what you're talking about and when you get your information from Wikipedia. And Angel's dad has asked me if I can publicly write that. Angel was born in Enfield in, in England, so he's English and he was raised in Manchester and he's been at United since he was seven years old. And I hope personally that he stays till he's 37 years old, but... Again, so this is the youth video. This is the right place to, to address that, I think. This is the, the place where most people interested in the youth are going to be doing that. So I've done that. Um, there you go. On to the matches then. So we have got quite a few matches because it's been like a week and a half since I uh, lasted the youth review. And I'm going to try and do this in some sort of logical order. Let's start with the under-23s then. A week on Friday ago at the Etihad, uh, it was one all. And uh, it was a bit of a fair result, to be honest. United were desperately short of specialists. And I've said this a couple of times in videos so far. Uh, probably the last three, four weeks. We've got a ton of midfielders who are excellent on the ball. Good ball-playing midfielders, happy and comfortable in possession. But they're not that specialist. They're not that guy that can open a lock. They're not that guy that can lead the line. They're not making the sort of runs and dribbles that you, you see brilliant wingers or centre-forwards making. And this game's shown that. Um, McTominay and Willock, they did great. But they're not out-and-out -out goal scorers. Um, one thing I am seeing, though, in terms of development, um, is, is doing them good. Especially Matty Willock. Matty Willock was a, a sound central midfielder, slightly on the defensive side, maybe. Um, a, a proper central midfielder. Decent distribution. Uh, I think he's got two brothers that are at Arsenal. Uh, one of them actually might have made the bench recently for the first team. Um, he's, he's a great all-round footballer, technically, as you would expect. But the, he seemed to always be playing within himself. Seemed to always be a little bit safe. This newfound freedom, he's been sort of been playing as a number 10, sometimes as a number 9, in the under-23s at the moment. And it's brought out this whole other side to his game, which is really good to see. Uh, he's always had that cool and calmness, but now he's becoming this brilliant footballer. He's developing an edge, like a real aggression to his game, but he's also finding that risk in his game as well, which is going to make him do something special. And... He's shown his ability in the final third. He scored United's only goal against City at the Etihad in the one-all. Uh, and that was enough for him to be my man of the match. He had a great game. He he dictated stuff. He was physical when he needed to. And it was, it was a joy to watch, in all honesty. Uh, DJ Buffon was given his under-23 nod in that game off the bench by Warren Joyce after a great display the previous week in the under-18s. He showed some real energy and quality when he came on. Uh, but it was a little bit late in the day. And it seemed that both teams had sort of settled in for a draw by that point. Next up for United, uh, the under-23s at least, was uh, Villarreal in what was our first Premier League International Cup match. The game was delayed a little bit because of the thunderstorm, which did actually call the game off. That was at the Etihad. 
Uh, but when the weather cleared, we managed to get going. Villarreal looked very good on the ball, as you would expect from a, a Spanish academy side. Very, very good on the ball. Excellent technical ability from everybody. Um, we did actually dominate possession quite a bit when we eventually found our way into the game. Again, probably the consequence of playing like six midfielders, uh, even as centre forwards and stuff like that. So, uh, but the, the man, the man that stood out for this game was Josh Harrop, um, exemplifying the fact that there's so many midfielders in every single position apart from defence for us and including defence really if you look at El Fattori he scored the only goal of the game on the back of an incisive pass from Hamilton uh, who had a good game himself as well um, he's possibly a little bit slight Josh Harrop if we're talking about him in terms of his overall gameplay and the sort of player that he is he's a little bit skinny but he's got an excellent body shape and movement. If you think the way Yanazai picks the ball up and, and, and has got that movement to evade people and stuff like that, and he loves the spectacular. He's not afraid to try a back heel. He's not afraid to try a one-touch dangerous pass that, that might not come off. And I like that from my attacking players. I like the players that have got that little bit of risk. And if you play it too safe, you're never going to make a chance. And Josh Harrop scored a great goal. Uh, it was also good against Derby last night as well, but I'll come to that in a second. Um, if we had the specialists around Josh Harrop in that number 10 position, if we had a decent left winger outlet, a decent right winger outlet, and just someone to lead the line, literally like a Will Keane to lead the line instead of a midfielder playing up front, um, then I think we would look so deadly. I think we would look so deadly because that number nine is going to drag defenders away. It's going to cause havoc. He's going to make runs that leave space for Josh Harrop because that's what a specialist does. They know those runs. They've been making them since they was 8, 9, 10 years old. Midfielders can do that, but they've not got that instinct to do it all the time. And I think if you had those players in and around Josh Harrop, you would really see Josh Harrop sort of flourish in that responsibility because he's got an eye for a pass. He's got an eye for a spectacular himself. And it's, I'm going to get bored of saying it myself, but that's United need to sign some players to help the development of other players. Now, yes, there's, there's instances, like I mentioned with Willock, in the City game where being forced to play him in different positions brings out another side to his game but this is Manchester United we're talking about one of the richest clubs in the world why are we being tight asses and having one of the smallest academy squads in the Premier League it's absolute nonsense so then Derby County Derby County came to Old Trafford last night and it gave us a decent test um, it was the same old United in, in terms of lacking that focal point so we've turned to Scott McTominay who did very well he scored two goals uh, and he looked like he probably could have had more in all honesty as well. But again, his positioning isn't that of a number nine. He wasn't making the defence stretch. He, he wasn't doing the sort of things that a natural number nine would do. But he still had a very good game filling in in that position. Uh, was probably unlucky not to really get a hat-trick, to be honest. Uh, Tuan Zebe was absolutely effortlessly good. Uh, he's, he's far too good for this level. He needs now a test. Now, I don't know whether someone needs to come in on a, on a loan, uh, take him on a loan. Uh, maybe if someone gets a bit of a defensive crisis, lower level of the Premier League, Axel Tuanzebe would do you a fantastic job if the club are open to allowing that sort of thing. Uh, there's quite a lot of centre-halves in his way to getting into the first team. Considering he played um, the whole game last night, I don't think you'll be seeing him tomorrow night against Northampton, maybe not even on the bench. But who knows? Um, adrenaline can certainly get an academy player through their debut uh, just for someone to see how they are. So even if he, he does 30 minutes on the bench, he's, he's clearly fit enough to be doing 30 minutes from the bench in the first team if he's required. I do hope Jose Mourinho takes a look at him this season, though, because he is a very special player and one that I cannot wait to see brought through and develop. Uh, again, Willock, uh, another good game from him. Uh, playing more advanced again last night, probably more of a number 10 role. Uh, it's great to see some of the feet from him, real real nice feet uh, in and around, close control. And he's a big lad as well, so it's it's nice to see a big lad that's got good feet that can go around players in the final third, which is what he was doing. Good, strong, all-round game. And I have to take the hat that I'm not wearing off to El Fattori as well, because that's a player I've been critical of in the past. But El Fattori had his best game I've seen him have in the United shirt. He's starting to look comfortable because he's always looked a little bit frightened. But he's starting now to look comfortable. He's starting to... Maybe look like he feels like he belongs. That's what it looks like to me. He always looked a little bit like an outsider. Now he looks like he's part of this team. Maybe someone's had a word and said, you're going to play right back all game or you're going to play right wing all game So or, or all um, season, so just get used to it. You're, you're all right, don't panic. So it, he looks like he's relaxing. And when he's relaxing, that's allowing him to do better things with the ball at his feet, but it's also allowing him to defend a little bit better as well. And it's nice to see. 
Um, so Alfa Torre, big thumbs up last night. And Josh Harrop, again, with another goal from Josh. Silky. Uh, classy and silky is the only words that I can come up with for him. You need to go and see him, and you'll know what I mean. This is, he's eerily similar to uh, to Joe Rothwell in a lot of the way he plays the game. But I'm a, I'm a fan of Josh Harrop. Uh, go check him out if you get the opportunity. So that's basically it for the under-23s. The next game is Everton next Monday night, which is away at Southport's ground. So if you're heading over to that, give me a shout. I'll probably see you down there heading over to that one, which should be a decent trip. Everton's always a good test, good academy at Everton. So it'd be nice to see if we can put a little bit of a run together of wins now because we've been indifferent, um, but we are the defending champions. So let's see if we can hold on to this trophy this season. The under-18s is where all the entertainment lives at the moment, though. And another five-goal thriller last weekend for the under-18s as they beat West Brom 5-3. Uh, Boonen, Chong, Barlow, Tanner and Angel Gomez providing the goals. Angel's now up to five goals in five games with four assists. Smoking hot form. And it's not just the goal scoring. To be honest, the goal scoring and goal creation aspects of his game is like... 5 to 10% of his game. That's not what his game is about. He's about so much more than that. Uh, and I put it to you that the under-18s league is far too easy for a boy who was 15 in the opening fixtures. Angel's development is something that I think is one of the most important things for the coaches and the directors of United Academy right now. He needs real, sensible guidance. And I think... I think while he's at this level of form, he should probably stay in the under-18s at least until probably Christmas time or something like that. While the likes of Chong and Buffonja getting called up into the under-23 squad on the bench, it's likely that Angel's going to get the nod at some point in the very near future, I think. But while he's performing at this level in the under-18s, I want to see him really develop the ability to put the imprint on the game the way he is doing. Um, he's, he's really not far away from, from demanding a, a game in the 23s. Um, would he be another midfielder? The problem that we've got of everyone being a similar midfielder? Maybe. Uh, maybe they would play him on the wing and bring him in so he's in and out of the game a little bit, which happens sometimes on the wing. But I think he's he's, he's more than ready. I wouldn't like to see it until after Christmas. Though. I think after Christmas, I mean, you've got to remember he's still 16, so it's a seven-year jump for him to go into the under-23s. And he's playing against Premier League first-teamers that are coming back from injury or needing match fitness in a lot of instances. So I, I think I would hold him back just a little bit until after Christmas and then see what you can do after Christmas with him. But he's, he's absolutely magic at the moment. I used to see him as a number 10 playing in and around and off that striker. And I've said he's the closest thing you're going to see to Messi in a United shirt. This season, he's played a lot further back. He's played a bit of an 8, a bit of a 6. 6 is probably too far back for him, though. I, I think... You want him on the ball as much as possible. And you can talk about his touch and his movement and his ability to walk past players because that's what he does. He doesn't run past players. He doesn't steam past players. He walks past players. I don't know how he manages to do it. He's, it's a trot. It's a jog. He's not sprinting past players. He's not using any physicality whatsoever. He's using balance and touch, change of direction, body movement. He gives them the eyes. He gives them the head. And then he takes the ball the other way. And he does it like walking. It's almost taking the piss out of people when he does it. You just you just want him on the ball as much as possible. And I think I've called him recently Iniesta-ish in the way he's dictating the play. But I think he's also got a bit of a touch of a Paul Scholes about him in the terms of the deft touches, the little one-touch passes, the outside of the footballs over to the wing. and He looks like he doesn't speak on the pitch neither. Uh, I've not noticed. He's, he's very, he seems like he's a very quiet young lad. So he looks... It's starting to look a lot scoldish, and the way he dictates the game is absolutely fantastic to see. There's a real player here, like a real player here, and I think if United do this right, he's an absolute certainty to make it. Right then, Manchester Derby. Yeah, you might have seen some idiot filmed me not being allowed to be sold a ticket by Manchester City's ticket office. It was a big fuck around for everyone. A lot of Reds had to get City fans to buy them tickets. They was just point blank refusing to serve to United, uh, sell to United fans. Or even City fans if they didn't have a membership number on the day. Which is an absolute scandal. If you come to the under-18s or under-23 games at Manchester United, you, what you'll see is a shitload of kids 
eight, nine, ten, eleven year olds. People taking their first game. I was with Abdul last night. His mate took his little brother for his first match. Um, my mate Chris was talking about taking his son for his first ever game at Old Trafford last night. That's what it should all be about. You shouldn't have to fuck around going getting a membership and go to the ticket office three days beforehand and all the rest of it. You just walk up and go in. It's free entry. It's free entry for all the United Academy games. Manchester City is supposedly the de- most expensive, most richest club in the world. It's a pound and three quid, right? No one's grumbling at having to pay a pound or three quid. They're grumbling at the fuck around. It took me three goals for the under-23 derby to get a ticket. They told me to come to the ticket office. I came to the ticket office, told me they couldn't sell them to the next day. I went the next day at nine o'clock. I walked in. I tried to buy a ticket. They said, can't sell you a ticket until half past five. So I had to go back at half past five. And when I went back at half past five, there's about 30 or 40 reds there. And there was even some getting turned away there. Oh, have you not got a season ticket? Yeah, you can't have one. Why? What the fuck is the point? Now, it's not like these games have had... There has been trouble at these games in the past, but it's not like it happens on a regular basis. The steward's there to deal with that. It's unsegregated. This is what happens at youth football. Just let fucking people in. That should have been a real big bumper crowd. Two big games, the under-18s, the under-23s. That should have been two cracking crowds. But City are limiting themselves by not allowing people to come in. And I think it's a fucking joke, in all honesty. But anyway, so the Manchester derby, the City derby, uh, the under-18s at the the, the little stadium. Um, supposedly City's golden generation, uh, the best team that they've ever produced. They beat us 2-0. But 2-0 flatters them massively. It was an ultra-tight game at 1-0. Could have gone either way. Uh, and then Mufa, Seb uh comes flying out. Takes out City's forward. Um, haven't seen the replay of it. At, watching it live, I thought he got the ball. It was a 50-50, but I think he went through him. Um, and he, I think he knocked him out as well. Um, so there was a little bit of a kerfuffle ensued afterwards. City's goalkeeper ran 80 yards to come and get involved. He got a yellow. Seb I got sent off. There was yellows dished out. There was stretchers. There was all sorts of shit. It was chaos. After that, City's team was too good to be able to hold on to just a 1-0 lead. They went and doubled their lead as United was trying to find a goal. Uh, and that's all she wrote. Um, it could have gone either way. Um, it was a good game. It was an entertaining game. It was end-to-end. Um, the standout for United was probably Angel Gomez, who I thought had a great game. Leo Connor needs name-checking as well because a couple of you have asked me about Leo Connor's development I thought he got turned easily in the first half. Uh, I think the right back, and I can't remember who who he had at right back. The right back was out of position a couple of times, and I thought that was exposing O'Connor because he's small. And I think he's a right back himself rather than a centre half because of his stature. But in the second half, that changed, and he was a lot more solid, and he did some excellent things, like real top-level things with the ball, with tracking and tackling his man, calm, composed, Look really good. So I'm interested to see how that back four eventually lines up with Terrell Warren coming back. If Roshan still plays any under 18s, he's still eligible for 18s. He's only 17. Uh, so you could have Terrell and Roshan at centre half. You can play O'Connor at right back. I think that's a hell of a defence starting to form for Manchester United. And um, I'm intrigued to see where they take it because they look like a solid side. Chong doing good things when he gets on the ball. Didn't really get on the ball enough. We didn't get the ball very eerily similar to what happened in the Watford game, actually, where, um, if not the Watford game, the final game where Rashford was isolated. We couldn't get the ball to Burkhart. It was crowded out a little bit from midfield. Uh, Gomez ended up coming far too far back, almost like as a number six, far too far back to be any sort of influence in the final third. Um, unbelievable touches from it. Every single time he gets the ball, it's decision making. He's just out of the world. Burkhart looks deadly though, very aggressive striker, didn't see the ball at his feet though, that was the only problem, the only chance he was getting was the occasional touch as a ball was whipped in, Uh, I would love to see him running at a defence if we can get a ball played in behind for him to get onto, as a defensive forward he was causing havoc for City, Like he made a few fouls but he made the City defence nervous to have the ball because... He looks like he'll just go through you. And I fucking love that. I love that physical intimidation factor. You've got to have it sometimes. Football, especially at academy level, is too nice too often. Burkhart didn't read that rule book. He's come with his own rule book. And I like that. No idea what's going on with Idris Kanu, whether he's going to be signed or not for Manchester United. Um, I think that's still ongoing. I'd like to see that. That might be a player, or Burkhart might even be the player that gets shooted up into the um, under-23 squad as they're desperate for someone to lead the line. I think um, Burkhart could do it. And that leaves you with potentially Kanu and also um, Bowie for the under-18 squad. 
So we've got a few striking options, uh, but below that, even you know the, the 16s, 15s, 14s, there's no one really centre forward that's doing it. So it looks like we're going to be bringing in players from outside rather than having people already in there. But that will do for the under 18s this week. Uh, and that's pretty much it for the youth review this week. The next game for the 18s is Stoke on Saturday. Obviously, we play at dinner time as well ourselves, so I won't be going to that one. The following game is going to be Middlesbrough on the 1st of October when we play on... I think we're playing Stoke as well, actually, on the Sunday, the first team. Uh, so I'm going to try and get over to Middlesbrough. So if you're going over to Middlesbrough for that one, give me a shout and hopefully I'll see you over there. That's it for this week's Youth Review. Um, please subscribe if you're new here. Uh, drop us a comment, any questions about any of the youth players, and I'll try my best to answer them uh, as best I can. And uh, thank you for watching. Drop us a like, drop us a comment, uh, hit that subscribe button if you're new, and uh, I'll see you next week. It, uh, it'll be Thursday next week. Uh, I copped up with uploads this week. Uh, it will be Thursday. Oh, and if you're still watching, uh, I also created a subreddit for Full Time Devils. So if you go to r slash Full Time Devils, uh, you can talk about all the Full Time Devils videos in there. The Adam and Gaz and that are all signed up for it too. And I also created one as I spoke in the Snapchat Q&A video yesterday about creating some sort of community for you guys where we can have some longer discussion. So if you go to r slash Housen, uh, there's also a subreddit for this YouTube channel. So go and get involved in both of those. Uh, thank you for watching and I'll see you soon. Laters.